Well, welcome back to the Dropping In Surf Show. Uh, today is June 4th, 2020. We're a day late in recording, uh, but we're still really happy to be here. We're recording from Belmarine Keys and Green Bay, California. My name is Rob Case. I'm a paddling coach, and my co-host today is Jim Sigelnik. Uh, hey, Jim, how's it going? Hey, Rob. I'm doing, uh, I'm doing pretty good. I guess uh, I should say, yeah, I'm a physical therapist. I treat any and all things orthopedic and uh yeah i'm doing good man how are you good so i've got something for you to start out i'm so, excited well um, is it is it a theme song it is a theme song oh yeah yeah so hold on <laughs> one second i'm excited uh okay let me know if you cannot hear this dropping in dev show oh, <laughs> I love it, man. I That's think all... we've, we broke a few copyright rules there, but... Oh, you know, it's okay. Uh, that's almost as good as um, Aki's on the Ockcast. Oh, yeah, that's right. That's right. I, get, I get so fired up when I hear that song. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I had, I, you know, hey, anything to make the show better. <laughs> that's just it. We're just giving the people what they want, you what know? What they want, yeah. I don't know if that theme song's going to stick, though. We might get well, it. I mean, because we're such big, we're so big time now. We're on iTunes and Google Play and Spotify that I'm sure NBC is going to call us up and be like, "Dude, you can't use that." Oh yeah, Th that's very well the case. You know, my life is 100 percent different since we've started this podcast. <laughs> I mean, I can't even go to the grocery store without people coming up to me and asking me questions. But I, you know, I'm just one man. You know, yeah, that's so right. That's right. I, I, I look at it as a good thing. We're regular people. I mean, regular that's people. it. You know, we breathe the same air and. You know, <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, we've actually got some great feedback. In fact, um, some great emails. Thank you guys for sending out emails and, and providing comments in the YouTube and, and shooting us emails. Awesome. So keep it coming. Yeah. Um, and, and to piggyback on that, Rob, um, I love the emails that we get that are like specific to ailments people are dealing with. Um, that's kind of like the my uh, most favorite thing about being a therapist is to be able to provide information for people that are dealing with very specific problems. So oftentimes on these things, I'll talk very generally, but like if you think you have an issue that's surfing related that you're struggling with that other providers in your healthcare team have not addressed, like email Rob or myself through our websites or whatever, and um, I'll get back to you. Nice, nice. Yes, it's saltypt.com for any of you that haven't listened to any of our episodes because we shamelessly plug our quote right. sponsors yeah uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah the, ch the check's still in the mail just so you know <laughs> yeah i'm good for it just cash it after the first oh yeah yeah <laughs> 2030 yeah that's right <laughs> <laughs> so um so i sent you a message this week about instagram and i kind of wanted to talk about it because I think we can go down a couple different tangents that are going to be mm. super fun to talk about. Mm -hmm. um, I sent you two different ones, but I want to talk about the first one. This was um, Samba Man's um, post, uh, a guy named Glenn Phipps, who's, um, who does, I guess, what was his tag? It's like not yoga. Not yoga, yoga I think. Not, yeah, yeah, I think he's yoga. a yoga instructor slash trainer slash surfer maybe uh, cool. sorry uh if sorry, he glenn. listens yeah. glenn and i <laughs> didn't um give you the right credentials we'll get we'll get it later uh and edit it in <laughs> there you go <laughs> yeah um so anyway glenn was it was a video and i thought it was a great video because it shot um, um he talked about the supination of the foot the front foot specifically during a turn and just being able to have that mobility and kind of what happens to the foot. And this goes back to, remember we were talking about that picture of Tom Curran? Yeah. And his mm -hmm. front foot was like basically 90 degrees to the stringer, but he was twisting clockwise. Yeah, to his left. Mm -hmm. To his left and really, you know, putting a lot of uh, torque, which I'm going to talk about from a biomechanical point of view, into that turn and that's the pivot point but 
but what Glenn was talking about was just check to see if you have the mobility there and work on getting the mobility in the foot. So I wanted to ask you just from a, from a, a, a PT point of view, um, what is this, what's he talking about with the supination of the foot and, and you know, he described it, but I'd, I'd love to hear from you, like what's going on with the foot, the ankle, the, all the way up through the knee joint. And then I can chat about the biomechanics of, of that. Yeah. I think before we do that, as someone who's a surfer and you watch a video like that, what's your, I guess I'm interested in what is your takeaway? Well, I, I, while I was watching it, I'm like testing it. You know, I'm te I'm testing, mm. I'm doing exactly what he's doing and I'm testing to see if I have that mobility. Because remember, we talked about two weeks ago, my, my back foot cracking and popping and, mm. and kind of loosening up because of the injury. But this is, we're talking about front foot. Now, historically for me, one thing that I've had trouble with, with, uh, with my front leg, and I got an injury from snowboarding from this, is that when you're snowboarding um, and wakeboarding, you're locked into the binding and you have that kind of forced twist mm -hmm. uh, counterclockwise to the way that your leg is. And I've had some knee twinges from time to time. And so I thought that watching that video, I thought, well, maybe, maybe that's the cause. Maybe my foot doesn't have that mobility. Maybe my ankle doesn't have that mobility to twist, kind of counter, counter twist. So that, that was my first impression is that I tested it and, uh, and I really liked the way that he started to explain it. Yeah, I think um, <clears throat> I like it too. You know, I think just as a surfer looking at that, I think it's a good um, it's a good test just to get a sense for what supination is and what he's talking about and kind of a theory there. I think um, and I did it myself when he was doing it. I was like, oh yeah, like I could feel that. That's kind of like a really I think simple way of kind of showing someone who's never even heard that word before supination like what the foot and ankle are actually doing and so that's why i'm kind of interested Jimmy there? in like what a surfer takes from that because like <laughs> you you know what i'm gonna say right i'm gonna say it's complicated and it depends jim you know rob you still there yeah hey oh so sorry I, your video froze on me oh dude you i don't know how long you were talking yeah, but that thing dropped like crazy. Yeah, I was like I got, watching I your face. I was like, oh, his video froze. Yeah, usually he laughs at my dumb jokes. Okay. Yeah. No, um, I, I so uh, go go back. To maybe we should starting cut that. off. Yeah. Go well, back yeah, so, to starting off. Yeah. So I think um, starting off uh, as a surfer, when I watch that, I really like it. I think I did what you did when I when I watched him explain it. I kind of like went through the motion too, and I was like, "Oh, that's really cool!" Like, I think if you've never heard the word supination described in a foot and ankle, it's like a really neat way that Glenn describes it, where you can get like a tactile kind of sense of what he's talking about and put some transferable knowledge to. Oh yeah, I can see that the front foot does that when I turn my body there. Um, so that's like the surfer in me, which is why I kind of like prompt you by asking you before I kind of like go into it because I kind of like you know what I'm gonna say right like I'm gonna say like silly things like it depends and it's complicated <laughs> and, and you know I like I have the uh clinician in me that's kind of like um if there was good cop and bad cop the clinician in me is like maybe more bad cop and so um I kind of have to check the bad cop with explanations sometimes um but supination is very, very complicated to discuss on a practical level. Um, Can you describe it real quick for anybody that hasn't seen that post? Yeah, sure. So supination is a term that we can use to talk about the foot and ankle. And uh, it really does depend. And I'm not just saying that this time. Like if we're talking in an environment like what we call an open kinetic chain, which is the uh -huh. foot is not on the ground. Um, it's going to do something different than what supination is during closed kinetic chain, which is the foot on the ground, which would be maybe more relatable to surfing because our foot and ankle are purchased on our craft, our board, and so that would be closed kinetic chain. And okay. so if you just start Googling supination, it gets really confusing. And even people that treat foot and ankles don't fully um, probably describe it correctly when they're asked, myself included, because it's super complicated. Um, 
But uh, essentially what supination is, is it's a, it's a three-dimensional motion. It's triplanar. And those cardinal planes would be sagittal, which are front and back. The frontal plane would be side to side, or what most people call the lateral. And then the rotary or the transverse plane would be more of a rotation. And so supinate, Dude, that was, that was all Greek to probably 75% of us, including me. So can you give me examples? So yes. sagittarial example? Yeah, so um, example. Yeah, so uh, I think uh, for those viewers, it might have been episode five. I went on way too long of a tangent about scapular dyskinesis. <laughs> if you want to yeah. just save the time today, just ditto supination for scapular dyskinesis, and we can uh -huh. call it good. But um, <laughs> no, uh, so supination, if, if you all want to do this, like lift up your foot from the ground. It could be your right foot. And mm -hmm. so the foot's not touching the ground. That's open chain. If you point the foot down, that's called plantar flexion. There's your sagittal plane of motion. Got if you it. point your foot in now with it going down, that's inversion. That's your Got frontal it. side to side plane. And then um, <clears throat> it's also doing what we call inversion at the heel. Okay, yeah. so there's like when you, put your, when you put your point down and in, it's kind of going side to side with rotating or scooping in the back. Mm -hmm. And so that's open, open kinetic chain supination. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, what uh, Glenn was describing that maybe I'll go into a touch more de detail on if you wanted to get complicated with biomechanics is essentially those same things are happening. Um, we're, we're except what's happening at the talus, which is the bone of what we call the mortise. So if my hand here represents uh, the top part of the ankle and the talus is here, mm -hmm. it's now going into dorsiflexion, which is coming up versus coming up. Yeah. going down. So that's and, like toe towards the shin. Uh, yes, but it's happening at one specific bone while the rest of the foot is relatively stable. Okay. And so um, what do we take from that? Uh, maybe it's semantics, right? Like, um, But like supination is like... Uh, I think functionally it serves as like creating rigidity in the foot to mm -hmm. either create a stable base or to provide some sort of propulsive effect. So if we looked at like gait and we, we asked ourselves when does supination happen in gait? Well, it happens in like kind of like the mid ladder stages of gait to propel our bodies forward. So if you're, if you can imagine you step with your right foot and your body transfers over, Pretty much when your body gets over the plane of your ankle, the foot's yeah. already starting to supinate to create a rigid lever to spring you forward, mm -hmm. right? And so, um, so it's kind of a way of creating this propulsive effect to catapult the body forward. Right. Um, now, if you think of it like one thing I really liked that Glenn said, it's, it's kind of like this energy transfer, right? Like he was talking about like if you do exercise that uh, doesn't translate to the foot. It's not meaningful, which again, you know, I think all exercise is good and carries meaning, but I see his point. Like yeah. when we do like, like, if I'm a regular footer and I'm doing, um, like a roundhouse or something in the f uh, front foot, like if we look at that picture of Tom Curran, the front foot and ankle are probably going into a closed chain supination as in, if you got, want to get kind of weird about it, the back leg's probably doing the opposite. It's probably going into like a little bit of a pronation thing, which right. if you rewind all the stuff I said about supination, it's the exact opposite, the opposite. Yeah. right? And so if you think about that, like- For every action, there's an equal and opposite. See how we bring it back to uh, <laughs> Sir Isaac Newton here? Yeah, <laughs> science and math. This show is about science and That's math. That's right, the hard hitting <laughs> science and math. And so, yeah, so, so if I'm, if I'm kind of uh, going through a roundhouse, that uh, front foot and ankle is serving as like a stable um, kind of base, uh, mm -hmm. whereas the back foot is pronated, which is more of like thought of as like a shock absorber yeah. um, and more of like a, 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 like more of a mobility aspect. So that might be like your driver there. Um, so uh, I don't know if I answered that question there, but... Um, uh, Actually, yeah. this is a, I think this is a good time to, to bring in some biomechanics. So you started to touch on that. And I like uh, my, my uh, contribution to this is really going back to that current picture and, and talking about torque in a turn. So how does this relate to surfing? Um, in specifically, Glenn was talking about speed generation and momentum moving forward. 
I'd like to talk about this from a torque perspective. So for those of you that don't know what torque is, torque is basically just force times the distance of the lever. And that equals the force. So, so if our lever is, let's say our foot, like connected to the board, that's kind of, or not, that's not our lever. That's, that's the point of torque that is all the way down there. That's what we're pivoting around on a roundhouse. Mm -hmm. We're pivoting mm -hmm. around our front leg. If we only uh, apply force, let's say at the ankle level, right? We're really, really low and we're trying to turn, we're completely compressed and we're trying to turn the amount of torque is going to be very low because the distance of the force from the point of torque is short. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so now as we go up the leg, so now just imagine imagine a wrench. Okay, so this is the way I'm thinking about it. You have a wrench uh, holding a nut and you could have a very long wrench or you can have a short wrench. Right? So if it's a short wrench, if you apply a certain amount of force, it would, the, the total torque will be a certain amount. If you have a long wrench and you apply the same amount of force, the torque will be much higher mm -hmm. and it will feel a lot easier. It's, it just goes back to the distance from the point of, of, uh, of leverage. Right? So same thing. So now imagine your foot is the part that holds the nut. And your leg is that long lever, is the handle mm -hmm. of the wrench, right? So now as we go up the leg, if let's say we apply force, the same amount of force, now to our knee versus our ankle. So now we're, we're not totally compressed, but we're still somewhat compressed in our, in our body. But we're, we don't have a straight leg, right? And we're trying to turn around that pivot point and all our force is going into our knee. The same amount of force that we tried to do with our ankle. Now the torque is going to be a little bit higher because it's a further distance from that point of torque. Mm -hmm. Now let's go up to the hips. Now if we get our hips involved in that rotation, now you're getting way more torque in that. And then if you just continue that all the way up to say the shoulders, and when they talk about opening up your shoulders on a roundhouse, you're getting the whole entire body involved in that rotational and it's so far from the point of torque that, or yeah, from the point where it connects to the nut, let's say, which is the board, mm -hmm. that you're getting the most amount of torque when you put your body into it. However, there's a lot of other things that are happening in the leg all the way up. But from a 100,000 foot view, that's why when you go into a roundhouse, you don't see guys with totally bent front knees you typically see their front leg fairly straight with a slight bend in it. And they're, tor they're pivoting around that and they're using that back foot to drive around that one pivot point. Does mm -hmm. that make sense? And yeah. that's how they get that, that high torque, that high power and keep the speed through the turn. Mm -hmm. Pretty cool, right? Like I think that, that is really cool. But, but there's lots of counter-rotating twists going on and that's my question to you is, We've talked about the ankle and the foot. Now, if we go up to the knee and then to the hip and then to the body, like the shoulders, dude, there's a lot of kind of delayed turning happening mm -hmm. of the individual joints. So you might start at the ankle and foot and then the knee starts a little after and then the hip starts a little after mm -hmm. and then you, you're twisting the body or vice versa. Maybe you start with the hips and then you work your way down but yeah. the, the, that relates back to what Glenn was talking about which I really liked I said I even gave him a comment I said man I like how you talked about how hey if isn't if your whole body if at least your hips down are not doing this twisting motion or this driving motion it's pointless mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. you have to involve at least from your hips down um, and I'm I'm a culprit of using too much of my upper body and so I'm trying to calm my upper body but at least from the hips down so yeah. thoughts on, on, on all the different joints being involved in that one roundhouse cutback yeah I think I'm going to attempt to start uh, maybe narrow and go wide so it's going okay. to sound cool. complicated and and uh, maybe hopefully turn into simple advice for people but yeah the biomechanics are really fun to nerd out on so like I think <laughs> Um, if we think of it like with what Glenn was talking about, essentially with supination, the foot and ankle become rigid. And then if I'm doing that roundhouse, maybe you can post up Tom Curran's pick here. 
yep. and uh, as I describe this. But um, so foot and ankle go rigid in the supination. And essentially, what that does is the back joint in the um, in the foot, called the subtalar joint, is now an inversion. And what that does is it governs the rest of the foot to not move. So it's yeah. like, it's kind of like, it I locks call, it in. It locks it, right? Yeah. And so as that happens, the tibia is going to now go into external rotation. And then that's going to kind of have like a lag at the knee until it hits the, a certain, what we call constraint, yeah. where it winds the tissue tight into, uh, uh, into tightness. And so if the tibia is externally rotated, and we say the femur, the thigh bone is in relative internal rotation until the yep. constraints hit. And then the femur will fall into uh, uh, now external rotation. And then the same thing is going to happen yep. at the coxofemoral joint or the hip joint, where yep. it's going to do like relative internal rotation at the uh, pelvis. Uh, the constraint will be hit. And then it's going to kind of flay or flare into what some like believers call an out flare at the SI joint. And then up the spine it goes. Um, so that's complicated, right? Um, and then, it, <laughs> hey, that's a new term. <laughs> and uh, and uh, and then maybe uh, uh, to counter your point, like yeah, for the most part, I think the front knee is straight, but there's probably a little bit of uh, knee flexion or bend in a lot of people's foot. And um, oh, in the foot, you mean? Or um, I'm sorry, the knee. There's a little the bit knee. of bend yeah. in the knee. No, absolutely. I think it's straight, most mostly straight, mostly with straight. a slight bend. It, yeah, it's and you'll see that in all the photos. Yeah, yeah. a lot of photos. I mean, it depends yeah. on the style of cutback. Like, yeah. you definitely see um, like there's a killer, uh, maybe not so much a cutback, but carving down. There's that famous picture of Tom Curran where he's carving down, where he's actually more compressed through his. Turn. Yeah, yeah. And You're so, talking about uh, back door. Yes, yes, that's yes. exactly it with the beautiful colors. I and, iconic. Yeah. Who shot that? Was that? Uh, I don't know. Servos. I, I don't know. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, sorry, but I think tangent. it was on. A, it was on maybe Surfer magazine or oh yeah, one it's of iconic. those. Someone I'll I'll, I'll find it and throw it up. People yeah. It. So it's those awesome. are kind of two different types of turns, and um, you know, uh, and then it can kind of go up the chain from there. But like, but the down carve. Let me go back to the down, the down carve is not a pivoting turn. It's, right. it's coming down and compressing down at the bottom, whereas the roundhouse, you are pivoting around so that you, right. you can hold the speed through the turn and then rebound off the whitewash. Yeah, so maybe the down carve is a wider arc and the uh, yeah. roundhouse is a tighter arc. And so, um, yeah, maybe that is a, is a good differentiating thing. Um, but I think in terms of like... Uh, centrifugal force and what we're talking about it's it's a very similar thing except one probably has more hip and knee flexion with dorsiflexion in the ankle and uh and it, so that would be more the down carve yeah and then, uh the roundhouse would have kind of the opposite maybe more relative knee extension hip extension the more, direction um, of force in mm -hmm. those different parts of the body are going to be different mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. and if you kind of went up the chain and talked about from the belt line up the roundhouse yeah. I mean, if you look at Mick Fanning do one, like he almost articulates from the top down. Like, so his trunk in, a, in many of his turns, like if you look at roundhouses he does at J Bay, like he's very, what I call articulated compared to a lot of other surfers. Like he can almost get like his belt line in his face looking the other direction before the board kind of catches up. And so what he's doing is he's kind of taking all that slack in the line and so if you kind of go back to what I just said and thought from the foot up is the bottom portion of the line and the head down is the top portion. He's kind of like pre-twisting it as the bottom is coming up. And then when the board catches up and move, uh, starts moving, I believe it's when kind of the tissues get tight in the middle, right? Yeah. Um, maybe right around this pelvis or core. Uh, I, I'm just imagining, you know, twisting a rubber band and then unwinding it. And that's really what you're talking about with the right. knee and the hip and the ankle. Like everything's counter rotating to a point, stopping, yeah. and then as it whips around, whoop, it goes yep. back into place or goes back into place and goes beyond it. Yeah, it's kind of like opening a jar, right? So like some surfers are all bottom driven, which would be like mm -hmm. just unscrewing the jar with one hand. Got it. Right? Some surfers might be highly top driven, which would be like unscrewing the jar, moving the bottle or the jar. Got it. Right? Oh, I love this analogy. And yeah. then what McFanny do, is doing, he's doing this. He's doing both. He's doing both. Yeah. And I think um, for me as a, like a movement person, 
when I watch people surf, I love watching Mick Fanning because to me, like he's he probably does that articulated movement better than anyone. Um, <clears throat> and I mean, Parco and I think Jordy do it really well too. Um, but like, look at, like if you start looking at that, like not everyone's roundhouse is the same. Some people move from the bottom, right? So they're yeah. kind of driving through the bottom and then everything from the belt line up is rigid and it's moving when the board catches up. Whereas some people have like a separation or a degree of freedom between their upper and lower half and then they'll just like turn their body and then there's a lag and then the board comes around. Right. And so like now I'll attempt to make it uh, simpler. Good surf coaches will say uh, lead with your eyes, right? So if I'm doing a roundhouse, like I don't need to know all those complicated mechanics. I could just go, if I point my head and turn my head and lead with my eyes, my body will follow, right? right? And then so like Mick Fanning probably does a lot of that mm -hmm. and has kind of like a, a really free lower body as that happens. Whereas a lot of people might lead with their eyes, but kind of more lead with their waist and their head at the same kind of motion. And McFanning's more independent with the head, which might create more freedom of movement throughout the whole body. So it's almost like a chain reaction. He turns his head, then the shoulders come, then the hips yeah. come, knees, ankles come around, and then he's, he's already going the other way at that point. Right, he's so it's very, it's very articulated. In, yeah. in my in my mind, it's like he has full control, and you don't hear a lot of people say surf with your neck or your head, or mm -hmm. but like if you watch him surf, he probably surfs with his head and neck better than anyone in a good way, because yeah. it does create that like visually pleasing uh, kind of style that we all come to love. Which I would kind of break down and go, that's because he's so um, nonchalant about it. He looks really articulated, like it's like if you ever watch a toddler kick a soccer ball what do they do mm -hmm. they move their whole body right they're trying yeah. to figure it out they're like you know they they bring their whole stiff leg forward and then their body kind of like comes forward it's really rigid yeah. and that's a novel kind of thing so um when you're a novice of something you tend to uh have less degrees of freedom because your motor learning is still trying to figure it out and the more advanced a person gets with a skill look at you know, a pro soccer player and they'll step and then they articulate like along the way, the hip, the knee, the foot, the, you know, it's very like articulated. And so that is McFanning. Now at the pro level, obviously all those guys and girls are super duper talented and um, I'm not going to take anything away from them. I just personally, uh, I really appreciate the articulation. And then there are some surfers that don't do that. There are some surfers that are more rigid here. Um, and, uh, and, and, and you can kind of say, Hey, that style's not as good. I guess style's subjective. Right. But I, I would say like, if you kind of broke it down to, you know, what we're talking about, I would say it's less degrees of freedom from the upper quarter, um, than compared to like some guys like style masters, like Parco or something like that. Yeah. Or, no, or that's really enough. interesting because I'm. You know, you even mentioned it. You're like, well, if we could break this down simply and help people or a good surf coach, they're going to say, look where you want to go. Right. Now, if they dive into this concept, like, oh, I'm going to look and then my shoulders and then my head, right. they're going to think about it too much and then it's going to look terrible. Then they're not going to actually get anything productive out of it. Yeah, I you know agree. I mean? And I think that's my own bias is to cue people with what we call external factors or extrinsic factors versus intrinsic factors. And so I think um, the clinician in me, remember I got a good cop, bad cop going in now with Glenn is, I love it. I think it's great. And at the end, he kind of alludes to, hey, check out more videos to see how I'm going to like, you know, integrate this. And I was looking for him and couldn't find him. So I'm really curious how it gets integrated. Mm -hmm. um, I would argue that a mistake would be telling a surfer to focus on their foot. Because if I'm a surfer and now I'm given by a coach an intrinsic cue that's super myopic and specific to something, by intrinsic I mean something that's happening within me as a surfer. Focus on something that is inside my body. That tends to, um, it's just my own personal bias and there is some motor learning research to back this up. It tends to not go as well. 
Yeah. Right. But if I if 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 I took someone and gave them extrinsic feedback, and made it as simple as pie, I'd say, look where you're going at the wave, right? And so, and I think that goes back to our conversation of the art and science topic, which yeah. I think is kind of a funny conversation. But if there was, um, in my mind, a, 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 a delineation of where art meets science, it would be knowing all those complicated things, but then using something that combines motor learning research and go, just look where you're going, right? And then yeah. see what happens, right? And if it yeah. happens the way you want it to happen, boom, you just, you just put the nail in the board with one whack. Right. Yeah. yeah. And I and I don't think that we're saying that Glenn or uh, some a man coached that way. But I think the warning is to not interpret it as looking at your foot. You know, right. I think they would be the first to clarify that. No, that's not what we mean. It's we're giving you an education similar to what we do. We're giving you scientific education right. or health education to help you understand it better. And usually when you understand it better, it will go to that subconscious and that's where we want to put it. We want to put it yeah. in that subconscious. It gives you purpose and meaning into why you're looking. Surfing coaching, I think, is the hardest. I, I've got it easy. I've got paddling. Like We can do the same repetition over and over and over again. And I can give direct feedback loop to people. But with surfing, it's so hard. Because mm -hmm. by the time that it registers in the brain, the moment is passed. Mm -hmm. And and I know I um you know I have those two way headsets the BB talking headset mm -hmm. um, that I use behind the boat um, and sometimes out in the ocean but and I know some surf coaches um, I know Clayton uses them down yeah. in Australia mm -hmm. and he and I have had this discussion where by the time the person registers the direction in their brain the moment is past so he has to anticipate the wave and what that person's doing. To, to do a simplified cue, and he has great simplified cues, at the right moment mm -hmm. of the wave, and I, I'm sure he gets it right maybe half the time, because maybe the wave does something different, or the body does something different. So it's, mm -hmm. it's extremely hard, extremely hard, man. It's extremely hard, and if you guys don't know who Clayton is, check him out. I love Clayton, the way he teaches, and he does exactly what I just described to a T, whether he realizes it or not. Like, if you go on his Instagram, you'll see footage of him training surfers in a skate ball, and he spray paints an arc on the ground, and he just tells them, go around the arc, right? So as you're a surfer, you're trying to, like, like carve this line. Right. Yeah. He's not saying focus on your foot. Yeah. Right. He's saying go around the arc. Right. And um, <clears throat> and then he'll change the arc to make him do something slightly different. And so that's a killer example of giving uh, a surfer that wants to get better extrinsic cues to make them learn better. Now, I say that and I'm not saying Glenn or Samba man. Is it Mon or man? Don't know yet. I <laughs> um, I'm not going to We're going to get some hate mail after this. I know. This one. <laughs> I'm not I'm, I'm not I'm not saying those guys will teach like that or teach like that. I think what they're putting out in the universe is really positive and good, you know. I think if there's something that we can take away from uh uh what I've learned um following um physical therapy related research is that the more complicated we get with biomechanics and the more we train to that Oftentimes we see the exact opposite effect. Yeah, overthinking. You know? And so paralysis yeah, by analysis. That's it. That's yeah. exactly. It. I'll give you the most common example. So, um, everyone probably in the history of Earth knows that or thinks that if you have back pain, you must have a weak core. Right. Oh, I, I love this rant. <laughs> This, so this is where you put salty PT like <laughs> right here. So um, yeah. and so why do we believe that? Well, there was a Queensland group that came up with research that involved needle EMGs, and I'll spare you the details. But um, <clears throat> essentially, uh, the budding research suggested that uh, there was this lag in the deep core muscle called the transverse abdominis, and the lag was present with people with back pain and not with people uh, without back pain. And what I mean by lag is they had them do functional things like reaching and bending and 
what they found in people uh, without pain is the transverse abdominis would activate before or during these movements automatically. We call that feed forward, right? And then uh, the people with back pain, they would actually initiate movement and there'd be this lag. Like the, the muscle wouldn't activate as fast as the, the non-painfuls, right? And so, and when I say lag, I'm talking like 0.2 milliseconds. <laughs> so, uh, like a thousand point two milliseconds just went by, like with me doing that, right? Yeah. And so, um, uh, so what did we take from that? Well, from that was the uh, kind of thought that, well, you must strengthen that to get back pain better. And so other kind of studies came along and then the, the, the um, belief got further perpetuated to the point where we had physios, trainers, everyone in their mother, their primary doctors, their chiropractors saying silly things like, before you get out of a chair, get your stomach firm and then come up, right? And so... Um, whether people that give that advice realize that or not, that was transpired by a two millisecond lag yeah. off faulty, potentially needle EMG studies. Yeah. And so what I mean by that is if you stick a needle in someone, like that's probably painful and it's probably not measuring what you think it's measuring because now that someone, someone's in pain. And so what research has kind of led to after that is we took non-painfuls, not we, the collective we, um, not me, um, but we've had research looking at non-painfuls injecting saline into the spine to create pain and then seeing the lag, right? So that begs the question, is it movement quality causing the lag or is it just pain causing the lag, right? And so since then, this whole core, we call it the core stability model, there's been research showing that if you volitionally uh, uh, or voluntarily activate something that's supposed to be automatic, you're probably going to put stressors elsewhere. So if I get really tight here mm -hmm. and then do a sit to stand, there's now probably more muscle activity or pressure going through my hips and knees, right? And so it's kind of like breathing, right? And I think I talked about this before. We don't have to think when we breathe, right? right? Can you imagine how exhausting we would be if we had to think every time we took a breath? I'm, I'd be ready for a nap right now. Right? And so this is a bit of a tangent, but what I'm, if I had to bring it back to my point, that's a perfect example of how complicated research mm -hmm. can change the whole trajectory of how individuals coach people with movement, and it doesn't have to be that complicated. And ironically, there are select individuals that are very attached to that model, yet they have more chronic back pain. Right. And so if we go back to the degrees of freedom kind of th talk we were just having people that move rigid with all movements because they believe movements are harmful, like bending, they go, OK, I'm going to get tight and then I'm going to bend over or I'm not going to bend. Right. Um, that type of belief in um, behavior tends to keep people in pain longer. It makes their tissues more sensitive. So if we had to kind of like save. um that from happening with a topic like this, we would say, let's just not get too complicated with how we coach people on their foot. And we'd, we'd turn it back to something more extrinsic to, okay, like we understand that's happening. I love what he said about like, if you don't have movement there, you can mobilize the joints. Awesome, for sure. What, what we're going to kind of have a tough time doing is figuring out what's a, a, a good amount of supination to have right because that's again it's a complicated triplanar movement like scapular dyskinesis and uh you know there's been a ton more research done on scapular dyskinesis than there has been on foot and ankle and to that point they still don't know what normal normal amounts of scapular dyskinesis are and there's no good way of measuring it and observational scapular dyskinesis measurements are probably the most unreliable so we could go through supination and measure the plantar flexion, the inversion, the, you know, all these different things like individually, yeah. but that still wouldn't like, like that still wouldn't uh, mean anything when we combined them, right? Yeah. Yeah. So. So so let me summarize for everyone, please, because I because at the I, end of the day, because I you know I am at fault of going too deep into certain things as well. Uh, we we all are. 
At the end of the day, the reason why coaches do that is to give you a little bit of understanding, but don't get fixated on that one research study or that one right. headline or that one thing that we're saying, especially with surfing, because everything happens so quickly. I, I think the idea is to, mm -hmm. to arm them with some knowledge, to give them motivation, to get back out there and say, oh, there, there's a reason why I'm feeling this way versus that. But at the end of the day, it depends. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, no, I love I, I, I love how you how you brought it back to that, you know, and, uh, <laughs> you know, one, one, one of these podcasts, we were talking about like um, surfing related research. And what Glenn is talking about is a perfect catalyst for exploring research. Yeah. So what would be super cool is if you can get some of these guys and girls on the pro on the, you know, in the pros and start measuring plantar flexion, dorsiflexion, inversion, eversion in their feet and um and trying to tie that to like maybe some of that like articulated roundhouse cutback stuff we were talking yeah. about and i think this is coming man i think in the next 50 years we're gonna see research using new technology that is going to be showing this i already know of a group that i worked with um at the wave co and wsl that that has certain technology that can start to do this which is really cool mm -hmm. Not, i can't give it away but mm -hmm. it is fascinating mm -hmm. what they can do with the new tech um it's just a matter of time it's so cool but again it's going to come out people are going to make conclusions and the media surf media i've seen the surf media blow things out of proportion too there was one about finger width of the hand when you're paddling <laughs> and dude i could go off on a 40 minute rant on that one and i'll yeah. show you the research that they pulled that from and, and oh, all the different things they didn't read right. in that study. Uh, maybe that's a whole nother podcast. Well, that's but. why we're doing this podcast. Yeah. Right? <laughs> like, you know, um, yeah, I, I'm going to write that down as one, another topic. I'm sure that that'll be a fun. Yeah, no, I, um, <clears throat> I, I, I love what you said. I, I think you're right. Like, I think it's just a matter of time before some tech company comes along and they're like, Hey, you know, when you couldn't measure scapular dyskinesis or foot and ankle supination, guess what? Now you can. Yeah. Right. And then we're going to go, holy cow. And then um, <clears throat> then that's going to kind of make that maybe a bit more quantified yeah. um, because we're really good at like easy things. Right. Like if you bend your knee, I can like stick my measurement tool up to it to it and probably nail it within five degrees. Right. But the minute you bend your knee, rotate your shin, and start kind of going that way, I'm like, oh, how do I measure oh, this? Yeah, right? right. And so we lose the reliability quickly once we start adding in different kind of planes of motion on something. And this is on land. Add yeah. water involved in this and add something that's completely variable in every instant. Yeah. Dude, I love this sport. I love what we well, do. Well, it, yeah, and awesome. I mean, that's like... It's exciting. <clears throat> And it's hard because, you know, uh, you know, whether or not a surfer chooses to do a roundhouse up back to the top of the foam ball or carve down, I mean, you know, chances are a different surfer could have done a different maneuver in that pocket. But, you know, I think if you get really, really skilled, which I am not, you could probably argue that there's a right turn at the right time. And so it's like no two waves are the same unless you live in or surf Lemoore, right? Um <clears throat> no two waves are the same. No two surfers are the same. No two body parts are the same. No surfboards the same. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, it might explain like all these complicated things, you know, which is going to like, you know, you've heard me talk before, like the body adapts, right? So like yeah. going back to like kind of some of the up the chain work or the kinematics we're discussing, like if you have a stiff, I don't know, talus, which you might have after being in a moon boot for a period of time, right? Mm -hmm. If you have a stiff tail, this doesn't mean you can't go surfing, but there might be some compensation of movement up the chain if it's not like, you know, externally rotating. getting to that point. Yeah, yeah if if it, the constraint that, comes earlier yeah. if the tibia can't externally rotate. Over and it goes there. back to how it's all connected. You have, a, you have a, a basically a bottleneck somewhere in your leg or in your body. Something else is going to make up for that. And that's where, oh man, here's another rant. You're in balance, Jim. Don't get me right? started. Don't, don't, don't get me <laughs> yeah. started. Don't poke the bear, Rob. Do, Jim, don't be imbalanced. You have to be completely imbalanced or okay. else you're unhealthy. 
Yeah. Right? No, no, no. But but the, like and and I'm being facetious here uh and Jim knows that. And that's another topic is the whole oh you have to always be in balance. Look at our sport. It's so mm-hmm. asymmetric. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Look at I mean it's incredibly asymmetric. And yeah. maybe that's a whole nother thing. But we've got to move on cuz again we have talked too long. <laughs> well, let me throw let me throw one thing in All right. there. Let final, me throw one final, thing in there. Final say. The whole, you, you said the word asymmetry, and I think it relates to what we're talking about. I mean, that is the whole thesis of asymmetrical surfboards. You know, so mm-hmm. like where, where you're talking about where the ankle is, like the heel lever arm might be this compared to the four, midfoot, forefoot lever arm if the joint's in the middle. So my back, back uh, when I'm turning on my back rail, this lever is less. So yeah. uh, it takes more force to turn, which might be clunkier. But how do you do that? Well, you, reserve, you shorten the rail line on the back edge to take away now that counter lever and vice versa. So anyways, I know you didn't want well, to have I a tangent. That. No, but... I love that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and and people might think that we're really uh, advanced in board making now that you no, made that no, connection. No, 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 no. But I just I have to be very clear that we are complete knuckleheads when it comes to board design. Yeah, I tried uh, making a board once and it looked like shit. So <laughs> <laughs> it probably rode beautifully though. No, it rode like shit too. <laughs> <laughs> All right, last segment. Uh, I'm calling it. Come on, help out the Grom. And uh, when I say Grom, it could be any age. I'm talking, you know, kids all the way to adult learners. You know, I've had clients that started surfing when they were 60, and they're loving it, and there's nothing wrong with that. So a Grom is a a beginner. So what's the best advice at the time of you kind of being new to the sport um, that really helped you out, that that helped you with that first learning? Yeah, um, well... Yeah, good question. I think um, on this podcast, I shared a little bit um, how early when I first started, I'd go to the beach with my friend and his dad. We'd, we'd like listen to Pennywise on the way to the beach. And I think um, the best advice I got when I first started was nothing. Yeah. And, 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 and I don't mean to be like callous there, but like my friend's dad was very um, kind of like open with his teaching. And so like it was a very brief like intro to like okay stand up on the board but i remember my first session was like i was standing in the white water just kind of like figuring it out right that and, right there what you just described was advanced lessons back in the day right was someone telling you how to stand that didn't happen right like it was usually like all right i'll see you out there yeah and you know i i look at people now with surf schools and this and like it's so great to like have that kind of like coaching like which I didn't have but like I feel like being younger like I was much more plastic with my learning and my learning style and my body like I really did terrible my first session but then where the learning came in was the conversation we had after which was why didn't it work for you yeah and that goes back to some of those like open-ended motivational interviewing concepts I kind of like briefly chatted about in the past which was like now I had to kind of like think about it right and i was like oh yeah like i um i don't know i just couldn't do it and then it it it, my buddy's dad was like watch these other guys do it and it was like what are they doing different that you're not doing so whether how old were you then can you you... um 11 maybe 12 okay and then um and then i think the more advanced i got the more uh uh kind of like tips he gave me but um you know i think going back to our point of over coaching like you know, and I think therapists, I'll speak for myself, when I was a younger therapist, I wanted every exercise to look perfect. Mm-hmm. And so the minute someone would like show something wrong in their exercise, well, stop, let me coach you again. Nope, 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 nope. Right? And like, I think a good coach will let um, an individual have freedom of movement, let them fail as long as that's yeah. safe, yeah. And, and then have a conversation about it after. You know, and I think that's exactly what he did. So, um, yeah, I think that was really. I think I'm gonna I'm gonna piggyback on, on that. Yeah, let me piggyback on that because your age actually plays a big role at that point. Because there have been studies that that talk about age 12, 11, 12, 13 is when our brains, the neuroplasticity in our brains in terms of learning, actually starts to decrease. Mm. Now, at, at, at right around that 11 to 13 age is when 
a coach, when a teacher can give explicit directions and the individual will understand it a lot better and be able to convert it into a motor learning movement. Whereas prior to, to 11 to 13, if you sat down with a kid and said, all right, kid, here's, here's what you do. You place your hand, and I'm talking about paddling, because I've had, I've had kid surfers, you know, their parents bring them, and, and they've been less than 11. I'm like, dude, I can't teach them the way that I teach everybody else. Right. Yeah. right? One, they'll absorb it totally different. Two, they're going to lose any sort of interest. So it's, it's about, all right, well, tr um, push backwards and go as far as you can. That's the directions versus, all right, here, listen, here's the third law of motion. Mm -hmm. Here's the second law of motion. And I'm explaining every step to the explicit learner versus the implicit learner right. where they're in the water. And, there's, and, and you look at someone like John John, and I look at his paddling. His paddling is very natural. It's very organic. Well, the dude was in the water every day as a kid, you know, after school, before school. So he learned implicitly how to move wa through water efficiently, effectively with power and acceleration, even without any sort of scientific coaching whatsoever. So I think your age at the time, he did a great benefit mm -hmm. to you mm -hmm. to not explicitly coach you through that mm -hmm. and to really more implicitly and then after explicitly talk about it, beautiful. Yeah. But I agree that even as adults that are explicit learners, there comes a point in which you overwhelm the brain. There have been many motor learning studies by Edward Thorndike, he was kind of the godfather, of it, that talked about how the brain can only process certain things at one time. And they, they used examples like playing piano and recalling a, a song shortly thereafter versus a second song. And if you had the longer break, you actually were able to recall both songs better than if you had a short break in between. And, uh, and, and I always related back to uh, my time as a, a surf and a wakeboard and sailing instructor at the aquatic center. I remember as a wakeboard instructor, sometimes there's so many different movements involved in that, that, that I, I could see it in their face. It's just, you could see they were just overwhelmed. And so I would just say, you know what, on this next time, they're trying to just get up on the wakeboard. On this next time, make sure you tickle your ear or think about tickling your ear before you get up. And they're like, what the, f what right. the hell? Is this guy's mental right now. I'm so frustrated. He's told me five to seven different things. And I'm just, whoop, popped right up. Mm -hmm. And it's that, it's putting all that, explicit directions out of the mind and just doing it. And uh, I think the most effective way for people to learn is a combination of the two. Yeah, I, I love 100%. that. Like, I think um, I think a good coach, and this is, again, my own bias, is having that open-ended conversation. Like, like if uh, you, we took wor your wakeboarder there and then they did, it did click, then the coach goes, hey, you did it. What was different? Yeah. And then they go, well, uh, I just like, I felt this pressure on the board and I just kind of pushed back. Yeah. Cool. Now I'm going to log that vocabulary because that um, visualization is working for them. And so further in during the training session, I'm going to be saying their words back to them, like push into the pressure. Right. Yeah. And so like, I think that's a sign of a good coach is to kind of like get feedback on those implicit cues. Yeah. And then turn them into almost explicit cues, coaching. Oh, absolutely. Over. In in their own language. And I think right. that's huge. That's why, as a coach, when you go down a certain street with somebody, you quickly realize, I got to back up and go down a different route. And let me explain this a different way. And I always talk to people. I'm like, hey, let me know if you need me to explain it a different way. Yeah. Because there are so many different ways to explain this. Mm -hmm. There's analogies there's i could have you read the research report yourself mm -hmm. i could have you watch a video right. i could actually manipulate your arm if you need me to yeah everybody's different um, Every, and until you actually different. know and until you know what your personal learning style is right and you explain that to the coach um it's kind of like what you said it's going down roads backing up going down another road right. backing up going oh i could pick the right road i'm gonna keep going yeah and that's very like, cool, man. Yeah, that is very cool. I think um, that's just it. Some people want the high levels of explanation. Some people don't need it. And yeah. uh, the coach can exercise all ranges. And, and yeah. And I mean, I think, uh, you know, I think something I kind of think about is like, uh, like I have the ability as a clinician to work with a four year old and I have the ability to work with a hundred year old. 
I have the ability to work with an expert or an athlete or someone who's novice. And it's kind of like, I think about it as books in a library, right? Like, mm-hmm. I'm like, okay, like, like I'm going to take out this book and try it here because it seems appropriate. No, that book didn't work. Let me take out the book right next to it. But to like yeah. take out like the most advanced book and apply it to someone who's not ready for that. Well, that's just either bad coaching or your ego, you know, meaning I want to show off what I know. Um, yeah. But yeah, I think we have both expressed how we've made mistakes in the yeah, past doing that. Yeah. Totally. No, I, I, I love how you talk about that, man. I think that's great. Yeah. What about you? You know what's uh, funny? Yeah. I was going to say what's funny is my experience, um, it, it didn't happen when I first started surfing. I was very much like you where I was just happy I got a ride to the beach. And me and my friends would just try to do whatever. And uh, we've, we embarrassed ourselves many times. But when I, when I took my first trip to the North Shore, which wasn't that long after I first started, maybe four or five years after I first started, uh, I have a North Shore uh, uh, story for you. So we were out at uh, Gas Chambers, Rocky Rights area, and uh, I think it was like three, second or third day into the trip, I was very intimidated. Biggest waves, most powerful waves I've ever experienced, but it was warm water, so I felt super comfortable and happy. And there were waves that were coming in that closed out. And I was very used to around here, just kind of flipping the board over, kicking it behind you, going under, pin drop under, kind of ditching the board. And especially in these size waves, I was like, I never tried to duck dive something like that. Well, of course the uh, Hawaiian local Hey, brah, don't you ditch your board. And that's all he said to me. And I was like, okay, never. And after that trip, I had dents in the two sides of my rails where I held for my life. But it was such great advice because I realized I could duck dive really big waves. I could find little air holes through these. Um, And I also learned that you can't duck dive in super shallow water. You have to find other ways to get through it. Man, I learned so much on that trip. And it was the simplest advice. Hey, bro, don't ditch your board. And I was like, okay, cool. Yeah. Yeah, he gave you explicit feedback. like Completely. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to pound you. And, yeah. and, and that same day, Johnny Boyd Gomes paddled past me. And I was like, <gasps> you take anything wow. you want. I'm not going to look at you. I'm not going to look at you. <laughs> wow. Yeah. That's, that's so heavy. cool. That is heavy. Yeah, that's cool. I, I, I love that. Yeah, that's... I, man, that's so cool. Man, I could just talk about the North Shore all day. Like I, when I was there, like and I'll, I'll keep it short. But uh, when I was there, <laughs> when I was there, I was like, I was like a kid in the candy store, just because I'm such a um, a fan of surfing. Like yeah. you, you go to the grocery store and you're like, oh shit, there's Job. Oh my, like, whoa, yeah. there's uh, Kelly Slater. They're in like, they're just doing their thing and like, yeah. Um, yeah. And then like, you get in the water and you're like, oh, I gotta like. I got to step my game up so I don't embarrass myself. And there's something intrinsic there where it's like, you know, I think you push yourself when you're, um, when you're around friends or, or people. Um, and that's, I think healthy competitive competition that kind of pushes you to the next level. Um, but yeah, that that trip was game. That trip was game changing for me. I came back from that trip. That was actually supposed to be a college, um, tour trip mm. and the the waves were so good that whole week that um the guys that i was with they're like do you want to go check out university of hawaii and hawaii pacific and i was like yeah it's kind of dead today and so we like drove past it we saw that the swell was coming and we drove right back to the north shore <laughs> and uh but that that I, I ended up going down to san diego for for college and surfing a lot of blacks and the first big swell at Blacks, I was out there and I felt way more comfortable because of the trips in the North Shore. That's cool. And it was um, it was a game changer from then. That's when it started really stepping up. So mm-hmm. that's super. Yeah, cool. everyone's got to go through that that those those meccas of trips. Mm-hmm. For them. Yeah, Very no. cool. And I see it on my Asu trips to Indo with with clients, man. I, oh yeah. And those 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 moments when they get it, and it's just electrifying as. As somebody that well, you guys get big swells out there. I've seen those pictures of you guys. I'm like, holy yeah. cow. Well, my buddy Earl's just like, yeah, man, I'm so sorry. It's only like 1.3 at 15 seconds. And dude, that's like 
overhead plus. Mm-hmm. And you're like, that's cool. <laughs> yeah, you're like, oh, <laughs> two, it's flat. <laughs> yeah. Two, two feet at 15 is massive and powerful because there's nothing stopping it. It's coming mm-hmm. from the roaring 40s and 50s and right up the Indian Ocean. Yeah. yeah. Very one, cool. the, one of these days, I'd, I'd love to get out there uh, to yeah. that camp. I'd, uh, I'd have to like, you know, put myself in some big ocean beach for training beforehand. But uh, <laughs> I see some of those pictures. I'm like, holy cow, like, you guys are nuts. <laughs> it's, but once you're there, it's one of those things where uh, your mind definitely plays tricks on you because of the perfection of the waves. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You're like, you know, if OB was that perfect and had a channel, you know, you'd be like, no problem. But because OB is like, oh, I can get caught inside at any moment in cold water. Mm-hmm. 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 <laughs> and it's not perfect. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's that extra element. And that's why I talk about with um, clients that you shouldn't measure waves uh, in terms of your comfort level, in terms of height. Because uh, a pitching, barreling wave is totally different than a mushy wave. Uh, and it's, it's comfort level is is the type of wave rather than height but i digress anyway hey man thanks so much we got some fun adventuring to do today oh yeah 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 so um we're going to very excited i'm very uh, excited about this chris and your uh surfing today and uh yep i was like ocean um, surfing yep I was in negotiations with my wife. I mean, I was talking with my wife about what I was <laughs> what I was going to do today, and I was like, "Yeah, so podcast with Rob, and then surf with Rob." And she was <laughs> like, "Wait, what? You get to spend all day with Rob?" <laughs> I'm like, "That's oh, the right. deal. That's the Hold deal." <laughs> Send flowers to Trish. Yeah, there you yeah, go. I got that, I got that go. on my list. Yeah, That's luckily for me, you're such a nice guy. So if I <laughs> if I if I did that with another friend, she'd be like, "No." But like the fact she's like, oh, oh, it's Rob. Okay, you can go. <laughs> uh, it's very similar with uh, at this in this household too. Yeah, yeah. No, but we're not just surfing, but we are we are biking in to Spot yep. X. We're gonna take in the sights. Yep. And uh, enjoy the whole uh, adventure of it. So we'll talk about it next time. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I'm a, I'm looking forward to it. All right. Cool. Well, I'll see you. Uh, I'll see you at um, parking spot Y, and. Uh, <laughs> and yeah. See you then. But thanks, guys, for watching. Thanks for listening. Uh, and we'll see you next week. Thanks, guys. See ya.